All right, so we are going to start. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Flo. I'm the uh, Corporate Innovation Manager uh, for the US branch of True Paris region. So I will be your host today uh, for our tech meeting dedicated to customer experience. Uh, so this session will be recorded. So please let me know if anyone would be against it. All right, so let's see with the presentation. So we're going to start with the agenda for today. Uh, so after a short introduction of what we do, I'll provide some, uh, some key figures about the, uh, the customer experience industry. Uh, and then we will move <coughs> sorry, to the, to the fireside chat uh, with our experts today, Lin Hanseker and Nyan Language, uh, to discuss the industry and tomorrow's big trends of innovation. Uh, so we will finish this presentation with a selection of innovative companies. Uh, presenting their uh, solutions and products. So we will uh, answer questions at the end of the fireside chat. So if you have any to our experts, uh, so feel free to use the, uh, the, the question feature of Livestorm uh, to, to ask your question. Great, so let's jump into it uh, with a short presentation of True Spares Region and what we do. So for some of you who don't know us, uh, True Spares Region is a catalyst for business and innovation. We partner with Fortune 500 corporations uh, in order to support international companies willing to expand uh, their and set up business in, in the Paris region. Uh, so thanks to our presence and tech ecosystem uh, located in San Francisco, New York, Beijing, Shanghai, and of course Paris, uh, we are in touch with over 4,000 international companies every year. Uh, so this unique relationship with large corporations on one hand uh, and with innovative, fast-growing companies on the other hand uh, led us to create the Global Open Innovation Network about five years ago. So through this global program, we organize about 20 events a year uh, to foster business and technology partnerships between large corporations and startups. So since the pandemic, we decided to switch uh, to online events. So it allowed us to, uh, to connect and, and get in touch with, uh, with people from further away, of course. Uh, so I would say it, it has been a pretty interesting experience. So in terms of, of topics and technologies that we cover, uh, we cover an era of, of technologies, as you, as you can see here. Uh, it's mobility, it's AI, uh, retail, health, energy, uh, and, and you name it. So, um, so today we are going to talk about customer experience. So first, um, I wanted to, uh, to show you a brief overview of the, uh, the customer experience industry. Uh, it is composed of different actors uh, from various industries. So it, it could be Adobe, Oracle, SAP, IBM, and so on. But it really depends on how we can define what customer experience really is. Uh, and, and in fact, we will see that later with our experts, uh, but pretty much every company could be part of it, maybe. Um, so here are the key figures I wanted to share today. I wanted to stop on three main figures really quickly to, uh, to set up the base of our uh, discussion with the panel. So the first one, today, the, uh, the global customer experience market size uh, is, is valued around $10 billion uh, based on a PwC report. Some, something important as well, uh, I would say, is that by 2026, uh, this global market size uh, is expected to reach $27 billion. Uh, and so that, that represents a compound annual growth rate of 18% on, on that same period between 2021 and 2026. Um, so those, end, those trends and industries where we can, uh, we can actually find customer experience innovations right now, or of course, automation, chatbots, gamification, and, and personalization or personification. Uh, but we will, we will come back on this. So to, to finish this, uh, this overview of the industry, I wanted to share this, uh, this non-exhaustive market map with you. Uh, we designed it based on different players uh, we have identified on the market. Um, it's missing a few actors, of course, but it gives us a, a good understanding on, uh, on what, is, what is happening these days. Um, I don't wanna get into too much details. 
So if you're interested, if you have a question, uh, feel free to uh, to reach out to me and I'll be glad to uh, to share it with you or tell you how I, uh, I, I, I built it. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, invite our two experts today. Uh, so Lin and uh, Yen, uh, if you can uh, if you can join me on stage, I believe I'm going to uh, to invite you. All right, so they're gonna they're gonna they're join uh, the the stage in a second. Um, so Lynn is the, uh, the chief customer officer and, and CX expert uh, at Clear Action uh, Continuum. And Yen Language is the, uh, the product and customer experience leader uh, at Amazon uh, and for, uh, I believe, the gaming department. But they're going to uh, uh, present themselves in a second. Hi, Lynn. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? It's great I'm, to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for joining. We're just gonna wait for uh, for Yen in a second. Uh, I think he's uh, he's going to join as well. All right. How are you doing today, Yen? You know, it's a wonderful day. I'm really looking forward to the weekend as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And yes. always talking about my favorite subject. How can I not be happy? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. A lot of uh, different topics to uh, uh, to talk about today. Uh, so I hope we'll uh, we'll have the time to uh, to to cover like the, the more we can. Of course. Yeah. Um, I feel like uh, Yen is having some trouble uh, just joining. So maybe uh, we can start, uh, and you can uh, you can maybe uh, present yourself. Sure. I'm Lynn Hunsaker. I'm Chief Customer Officer at ClearAction.com. And our specialty is helping companies, especially people in marketing, customer experience, customer success, customer care, even employee experience and partner experience to be influential to the rest of the organization in helping them prevent problems for customers. So we have a lot of e-learning and an online community, which we call the Experience Value Exchange, which teaches uh, these groups how to uh, inspire more uh, use of experience insights across the company and uh, to, to build the growth of, of your organization uh, in many ways because of that. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my background is that I worked at Applied Materials for 11 years in the semiconductor industry. Uh, I was head of corporate quality there, started out as a voice of the customer manager and uh, before that, I was at a packaging corporation where I was also a voice of the customer manager reporting into the strategic planning department. So it's a pleasure to be here. Amazing. Thanks so much. Uh, Yen, hi. How are you doing? Good. Thanks, Flo. Uh, apologies for the delay getting on. All kinds of Chrome security issues uh, <laughs> logging into Livestorm. So anyway, uh, delighted to be with you. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining as well. Um, I don't know if you could hear, but maybe, yeah, you can... Uh, Present yourself to give some uh, some context to the audience. So, present sure. yourself. Tell us a little bit about you, the organization you're representing, maybe on the initiatives or current projects. Sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, even though I've been in CX for ten plus years at this point, I still consider myself a product person, and those are my roots. Uh, but I got into CX primarily because it gets you closer to the customer. You have more impact on the customer. Uh, than in any other area. So for me, that's you know motivating and very satisfying. My background is uh, Samsung uh, working on post sales and building post sales platform for them in North America. Uh, Intuit uh, with small uh, businesses and mid sized companies, uh, and then now with Amazon uh, focusing again back on consumer uh, in their game space, which is about as complex a, a CX environment as you're going to encounter. <laughs> yeah, I bet you're definitely going to. Uh... To explain all that uh, if uh, if you want later. Um, great. So I think we can start uh, first. My first question, uh, very general question, uh, because we uh, we saw it, you know, during the uh, uh, the short overview of the industry. Um, it's not always quite clear what is customer experience uh, and and what customer experience could be. Uh, what's in it, or like you know, what what is a customer experience company? Uh, so can you can you help on that? 
Absolutely. Customer yeah. experience is often used interchangeably with so many other things. Uh, kind of like the word value. You know, you could say you're a value company. Everyone could say that. But uh, there are certain uh, uh, techniques and uh, technologies and so forth that actually create value or enhance value specifically. And unless you're really focused on uh, on that, you might not say that you are a value company uh, when there, there's something a little bit more appropriate. The way I like to think about it is that the first people on earth who bartered uh, had a customer experience. There was an expectation and uh, an evaluation of, did I get what I expected? And that's what customer experience is. Uh, customer experience management, on the other hand, is what we do in companies to react to the, the customer experience or to help shape it and prevent issues, uh, try to close the gap between uh, expectations and what was received. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, Lynn's point is an excellent one, which is uh, it doesn't matter what kind of company you are, customers are having an experience, uh, whether you realize it or manage it uh, or not. Uh, I used to think that that customer experience was the preserve of post sales environments. So marketing and sales did all of their every, upstream work. And as soon as the customer was acquired, the customer experience applied downstream. I, I fundamentally disagree with myself at this point and think that it is the entire experience end to end. What I would say is there are there are essentially two types of companies. Uh, there are companies that have transactions with customers and there are companies that have relationships with customers. Um, regardless of what type of company you are, your customers are having an experience that need to manage. But if you are a, a company that wants a relationship with customers, and to Lynn's point, I don't know any company that would not want an ongoing relationship uh, with customers, then then customer experience is everything you do to connect with your customer. Mm -hmm. So so you would definitely say that every company is is a customer experience company right now. Just yeah. as every company is a financial company, every company is a, <laughs> an operational company. Yeah, it's just part of it. Yeah, yeah. if you have customers, yeah. you're a customer experience company. Uh, it might not be your strategic priority, uh, but but it is going to be a strategic priority at some point, and you are going to have to recognize that that's the company you are. Mm -hmm. And so, how how did like customer experience um, changed and and transform over the years? Um, Lane, you mentioned you know like since you know like the first human on Earth. Um, <laughs> how how did that really change and you know evolve over time? Yeah. So what I recall is that. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, we had a lot of competition from the Japanese uh, industries. And uh, well, particularly here in America, we were uh, facing a lot of uh, downturn in our steel industry, uh, consumer electronics, uh, automobile, semiconductor, and so on. And um, largely because of that, companies became much more attuned to how do customers see us? How do we improve quality? How do we uh, become more competitive in um, maintaining our market share and uh, re reclaiming and become, you know, becoming leaders where we want to be leaders? And so uh, what I remember in 1991 was an article published by Fred Reicheld in the Human uh, Harvard Business Review. And it was about the... Uh, cumulative value that a customer who stays with your brand provides in terms of recommendations, uh, price elasticity, uh, buying more of your product line and so forth in term, you know, and pointing out as well that the acquisition costs sometimes is quite large. And so having your customers stay with you longer is uh, advisable. So that was kind of new thinking at the time. And uh, I became a voice of the customer manager in a major corporation, Fortune 250 at the time, uh, in 1991. So uh, it's been going on for a long time. At that point, we were very interested in improving quality. It was much a part of ISO 9000 and TQM. But then in uh, the late 1990s, CRM emerged and that kind of derailed the quality movement around customer experience. Experiential marketing took off in the early 2000s, which then uh, played into the economic downturn in 2008, 2009, 
and everybody was uh, jumping on the CX bandwagon at that point in order to try to uh, navigate through the economic downturn. Um, so the tech firms that provided enterprise feedback management and social media monitoring, anything that would help you save your customers uh, and maybe come out of the economic downturn quicker, I think those tech companies did not even feel the, uh, the downturn because there was such a clamoring for them. But since then, um, of course, we've had a lot of uh, inroads in CX with technology such as AI, VR, uh, bots, and, and on down the line. So it's been quite an interesting thing to to be a part of in my entire career. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, Lynn is such an expert in this space. It's awesome to to hear that. I, from a, an operator perspective, I uh, you know you'll certainly see a lot of companies getting to grips with digital. Um, I think a lot of companies start their CX in a support space. And are starting to widen out from that, right? When you start hearing people talk about support becoming proactive, essentially they're talking about getting into customer experience management uh, one way or another. Um, but there are so many other dimensions to that: building communities, uh, driving loyalty, um, engagement, onboarding, all of which, as you make a shift to digital, have to be you know a lot more buttoned up. And the the first problem a lot of companies encounter is data. The next problem they encounter is organization. Uh, and so you kind of see different companies at different stages going through that transformation. Um, and depending on the company, it depends on the, the nature of those things. But once you've got through the data problem, uh, and a lot of companies are discovering they have a lot of customer experience data, it's how do you organize it? And then how do you act on it seamlessly as an organization? And that leads to some really, really interesting situations. You get everything from companies creating chief customer officer roles through to entire reorganizations. Uh, and uh, you know, there's an infamous story of a company USAA, which is a, a US insurer, uh, which once they realized uh, that the significance and the importance of customer experience management ended up reorganizing their entire company uh, top to tail uh, to be able to deliver that effectively. So somewhere on that spectrum, uh, most companies are, are at, um, but digital is definitely driving a resurgence of this. Yeah. Um, definitely, and, and and talk about digital. You know, like you uh, you, you both uh, talked about. You know, like the I guess the the, the rise of, of tech companies. Um, so how did that change customer experience? Um, I believe like we have we had actually like the rise of digital CX, right? So so what is exactly digital CX and and and, and the difference with regular customer experience, I guess. So I'm, I'm happy to dive in a little bit on that. Um, I think there are the two dimensions to it. The first is how customer expectations changed. And then second, how do businesses respond? Uh, and the, the first is the prime mover in all of this, which is all of a sudden in a digital world, customers expect to be known. They expect to be understood. They expect to be personalized in your response and targeted. And they expect you to be super efficient. Uh, because this is the promise of digital. Um, and so if you're not delivering those things, you're immediately letting your customers down in those environments. Companies responding to that, uh, I would say I've seen uh, certainly companies I've worked at go through the wave, like I talked about, of getting their data, getting to grips with their data, uh, breaking down the silos between their data sets uh, and, and making them much more customer centric uh, to be able to do some of that. Uh, and then being able to respond holistically, then you break through your organizational silos because experiences often transcend, right? For example, a great example would be uh, at Samsung, one of the big things we realized in onboarding that drove success of customers with their new phone, their new TV, their new appliance uh, was what we had promised them in the marketing before they bought was what was immediately paid off after they started the product and onboarded to the product. So simply by making sure the first thing that they encountered in their experience of unboxing and onboarding after they had bought it, reflected the marketing message that had brought them there, uh, reduced uh, what we call remorse returns, people bringing the product back to the store by 30%. Wow, okay. Lynn, yeah, you wanted to, uh, to add something? Uh, well, it's, it's really important to make sure that when you do add technology that it actually enhances the customer experience uh, compared to a person-to-person -person or uh, you know, the traditional 
method. Uh, for example, there's one brand that I've uh, bought for 28 years. And when I uh, logged in to get some help on something that I uh, absolutely needed to to uh, to get an inter inter interaction with, uh, the bot couldn't understand my name. Uh, there was no recognition with the telephone number that I was using. So, you know, I'm used to that from other brands. Uh, just yesterday as well, um, there was a situation where uh, the uh, the the uh, the solution could have been solved in uh, like 90 seconds instead of the 90 minutes if I had been talking to a regular person instead of <laughs> using the the chat that that we had going on. So it's really important to make sure that what you're implementing is actually enhancing and making things more efficient rather than uh, turning people off. Yeah. So 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 you would say that. There are some some downside of like all digital, and that you know keeping you know like the the human interaction is is really important for you. Yeah, human to human is the name of the game because people are. Uh, uh, it's all it's really about trust, right? And uh, especially if people have been buying from a company for a long time, they want to make sure that. Uh, that uh, that is recognized, that that's valued. Um, so it's interesting that the Edelman Trust Barometer actually has a section in it um, about technology. And there are quite a few uh, interesting um, statistics in there, uh, such as 61% uh, of customers are worried about losing their freedoms as a citizen because of artificial intelligence and things like that. 67% uh, of people are uh, concerned about cyber attacks and hackers. So I would uh, recommend to take a look at the Edelman Trust Barometer because it's very uh, insightful about what we in tech need to be paying attention to uh, wherever we are in the world and whatever uh, sub-segment of tech we may be in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, Jens, same, same kind of question. Um, I feel like we... We like with the, the beginning and, and, and the rise of bots um, on every single website. I feel like uh, companies uh, use only that at first for like a couple of years. But I feel like lately, I don't know if it's because, uh, like you said, Lynn, you know, like it, it, it needs some, some interaction. But I feel like companies went back on this uh, and are putting back a little bit of human. So when you're talking to a bot, you can actually ask to get a person now, uh, which before it wasn't really possible. Um, why are like companies transforming or like coming back on it? So I think it's stage of evolution, uh, to be honest. Like, I think uh, the initial wave of bot adoption was driven by customer, uh, companies trying to save money. Uh, human beings are more expensive than technology. Uh, and so, you know, traditionally what you see is we want to be customer obsessed company. Uh, we want to we drive up our customer experience. All of a sudden costs start ramping up. And so businesses start to look for ways to reduce those costs. Chatbots, the promise of chatbots and AI was absolutely initially uh, to reduce uh, cost and, and not have a human handle that contact. Um, the reality is, is uh, bot technology then was a little nascent. It's really good now. But even so, what's what's different is companies are starting to realize that bots are part of the solution, not the entire solution. And so when you look at customer experience generally, it's how do you fit bots within uh, the other experiences that you've got? So uh, backstopping with a human escalation, a bot is, an, is like an absolute must. I don't think you can launch a bot this day um, and not have consumers expect to be able to get to a human through it. That's one of their primary purposes in most bots. And in fact, we look, generally speaking, at Intuit particularly, we did this, we only look to use bots when a bot experience is better than a human experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, you have to assume it, 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 the customer is actually very helpful, generally speaking, which is uh, most customers don't actually want to talk to another person. I mean, you think about it, you know, you don't you barely pick up your phone to speak to your friends and family. You'd much rather text them, um, even people that you love. So the last thing you want to do is pick up a phone and speak to a company. So if you have to, it's you don't want to have any obstruction to do it. but a customer, generally speaking, is quite happy to engage with a bot where that bot is more, more efficient. And there's some super technologies out there um, to do it. But it does open up the question, 
for me, um, which is you can't do it well and you can't build bots well until you take a look at your entire customer experience stack because you can't build these things in isolation. So your bot has to be a service which can, this is the product manager and me coming out, your bot has to be a service you can be, can be deployed across multiple channels in multiple ways. It has to be deeply integrated with the other things that you've got, customer data to be personalized, the ability to escalate to human contact. The integration of your bot service with everything else um, requires you to have a very robust customer experience management platform. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, interesting. And so, um... With with AI getting bigger and bigger, and I'm I'm pretty sure we're gonna see some uh, uh, some some great companies later on uh, for the presentation. But with with AI uh, performing, you know, better and better, um, do you think bots are gonna stay as like the big thing, or do you know how is that going to evolve? I think there's so much more with AI besides just service or bots. Uh, there's many ways to use AI to um, be predictive of what customers need or what uh, would be the best um, solution to to offer them or to weed through a lot of text and voice and video and pictures and such to uh, frame a better picture of uh, or an il illustration for management of what's happening. Uh, what are the trends? What are some interesting patterns in order to further differentiate your brand, to um, be more forward thinking in how you uh, design things so that they are a hand in glove experience from the get go and whatever you're creating. So I think that there's so much more use for AI besides uh, remedial uh, applications. And frankly, when people need service, it, it um, is usually an indicator that there was something sloppy uh, earlier on with the non-customer facing people not quite understanding what customers need and uh, making sure that everything is timely and a well-oiled machine in your company. Yeah. Um, talking about AI, actually, we, we, we have a, a question from a, a one of the participants, actually. Um, how um, new privacy rules and, and regulations are going to impact uh, customer experience? Because you're talking about AI, uh, pretty much gathering more and more data uh, from uh, from from people and users. Um, so I think it's a it's a very interesting question in terms of uh, privacy and and you know like data. Um, so how how is that again, you know, going to affect it? Yeah, it's really important. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, tr uh, trust in technology was much higher than it had been uh, and actually outshone other industries. Uh, but we saw that that declined as things kind of unraveled with uh, people's concerns, everything dragging out a long time, um, having uh, social media snafus and um, privacy uh, data breaches and things like that continue on. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity to shore that up. Uh, probably Ian has some good insights on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't generally hold AI as being a, you know, there are privacy issues in AI. That doesn't seem like it's the zenith of the, the privacy issue from my perspective. Um, you know, it's possible to work off anonymized data sets, to work off artificial data sets now even, uh, to build and, and uh, develop your AI. So certainly it's a, a watch out. But I think where it comes really comes to the fore is personalization where how do you marry the, the needs of for privacy with the, the requirement from the customer to deliver a personalized experience? And, and there in those rules, you know, it, it's all driven by permission and it's permission based. So if the customer has given you implicit or explicit permission and it's not contravening local market regulation, um, then, then that's the cardinal rule. Then you can give personalization. But there's a real tension there. And how do you build the relationship with the customer in order to enable you to give personalization? AI is, I think, less of an issue, but certainly one you shouldn't let go of that issue and, and the data that you're using to drive AI should be certainly compliant with all of, uh, of all of the privacy regulations that are around. Mm -hmm. So in terms of innovation, we, uh, we, we talked about bots, we talked about AI. So do you think that personalization is going to be, you know, the, the thing that goes more and more and more uh, in, in terms of CX? Yeah, absolutely. 
it, it's we're very used to delivering generic experiences and this is the this is i think the, the big philosophical shift in in certainly in digital um we're very used to delivering you know channels and landing experiences and making them rich and effective and even programming them to a certain extent um but ultimately uh where this is works best is when the customer the individual customer comes to one of your ingress points and the experience they get there is totally reflective of them so we know they prefer text to preferring email to preferring self-serve on written articles or if they like written articles they like the full article or they like community third-party content uh, they like to feel like it's somebody else who's already solved the problem real world um, and serving them that experience first and foremost that's where you get to the promise of of customer experience management so you know i'll give you the the, the what, what for me is always in the back of my mind when i think about this based on my experience and it's actually an amazon experience though i wasn't working at amazon at the time so um and i will tell you it was a, a an order which had gone astray um and i didn't know where it had gone and so i was like ah, uh i'm gonna phone them um what i went to do to the, i went to the website looked at the order next to the order it said do you have a problem with this order i said yes just literally clicked one button that said yes they offered me a choice of channels um, but they recommended the channel for me uh and they said it'll take 43 seconds to connect you to uh, an associate uh, and a person will be able to deal with it so i knew exactly what i was getting i clicked on it 43 seconds later it's like slightly less than 43 seconds later somebody came on the phone they said um hi is that ian I said, yes. They said, are you having a problem with this order? I said, yes. They said, could you give me a second? 23 seconds later, they came back on the phone and said, I'm so sorry about the delay. However, I've checked into your order. We've replaced your order. A new order has been sent and it's on its way to you now. And we've, you know, we've done this, this, and this for you. End to end, that contact took 43 seconds. And I walked away from it. This, that was... 10 years ago, I am still talking about it now. And when you talk about NPS and measure around customer experience, that's what we're talking about. Those kind of delightful experiences, being able to deliver those. If you've got your customer experience management dialed in, that's what you can do. And 10 years later, your customers can still be talking to you, talking about it. Mm -hmm. Wow, great example, of course. Um, Lynn, same kind of question, is it like, we're going away from generic, uh, as as uh, Yain said, or like and getting more by like customer centric CX world. Uh, yeah, I think that um, that that example that Ian just shared is just uh, mind blowing. Uh, that happened ten years ago, and m most companies that I, I I have never experienced something like that from any place. Um, but yes. Uh, Becoming more uh, personalized uh, and more customer centric is something that um, we, we have to do. Um, how you do that is actually demonstrated by some of these tech leaders like the Zappos CEO or even uh, yeah, Amazon, uh, where they started their organization or at least uh, early on decided, here's how we want our customers to feel across the end, end journey. Here's what we want to be reminded, remembered by. Um, or here's what we understand is uh, really important to the expectations, the intended outcome of whoever is our uh, core growth customer group. And once you have uh, identified that as a North Star for how you want to run your business, that in these examples with these uh, CEOs, they use that as something sacred in terms of the criteria that they use for uh, who they would bring in as investors or uh, board members or uh, C team members, who they would bring in as uh, staff people, staff members of any type in order to fit what the customers need. And so having uh, that intentional CX as a guide for how you're going to be managing your business through and through, how are you going to be reviewing uh, the business at all levels in all ways and how you're going to uh, reward people that's the way that you uh, minimize your costs, uh, cost to serve. That's how you become a, a, a well-loved uh, company that people will tell amazing stories to, to, uh, that are positive to their friends about and uh, you know, spur your growth in so many ways. Yeah, definitely. Uh, great. Well, 
another question about uh, another innovation that is actually in everyone's mouth. Uh, when talking about innovation, I work with uh, innovation departments uh, and they actually already, you know, everyone is already talking about VR and the metaverse, of course. Um, without like getting into further detail on, you know, exactly what, what, what are those things are, um, do you think it's going to change completely uh, the aspect and the, the you know, um, the experience uh, for, for customers, the, the user experience? Um, are people already, you know, working on this uh, uh, in, in your, you know, uh, environment? Uh, so I'm happy to weigh in a bit on this. Um, so... Uh, so customer experience uh, management is going to go through um, a radical um, upgrade. Needs to go through a radical upgrade when you when you work in a, a VR or metaverse world. And I know this because in the game space we already build and operate uh, virtual worlds. Uh, and when you are in a virtual world, uh, the capabilities of the customer to behave in different ways and act in different ways, you know, explodes exponentially. Um, and so you're not just managing them through a channel. You're not just managing engagement with the product. They can do all kinds of different things that they couldn't do before. Um, and so where you end up going, firstly, you have to be better uh, than you ever have done. Um, and secondly, you have to encompass a bunch of new experiences that you're going to have to manage uh, and manage across. So, you know, uh, I don't imagine most companies think about uh, the need to manage um, uh, economies, right? Customer experience manage economies. In a game, uh, a lot of big virtual world games have their own economies. All of a sudden, you've got to have economists in the group. Um, secondly, people behave with other people. They're interacting with other people, and that opens up bad behaviors, for which gaming particularly is uh, infamous. Uh, all of a sudden, you've got to have a police force, and you've got to operate a police force in customer experience management um, if you want your customers to have a good experience. Uh, add children into the mix, playing games. And you have to have a really, really good police force uh, to make that work. So I think, you know, I generally look to gaming. And one of the reasons I work in games is because it gives you a preview of the kind of custom experience challenges you're going to have to manage. They are going to become a lot broader uh, and a lot more skills uh, going to be needed. And you have to be a far more buttoned up than you ever have. The kinds of technologies and telemetry and uh, data that we have flowing to be able to manage in a virtual world is so much more than we would have in a, in a non-virtual environment mm -hmm. to be able to do that well. Okay. But the good uh, news is it's super early stage. So we've got time. Yeah. It is. It is definitely. Uh, Lynn, same kind of question. Do you see that coming in, in your space? 100%. Everything that, um, that Ian said is, is right on. And, uh, you know, the whole idea of customer centricity is just to be putting yourself in the customer shoes at every point of, of, uh, of the way. So essentially the things that uh, Ian was describing is the, the best answer to, to each one for your tech decisions is how is this going to come across to customers? What are the potential reactions that they'll have? Uh, recognizing that there's different people with uh, in different parts of, of the journey and different uh, uh, perspectives uh, uh, with re relation to uh, the use of those technologies around, uh, um, you know, within your product and around the, the journey that they have. So in, the more that you can uh, encourage your, your people as well as the technologies you use to have that anticipatory um, quality, the better off that you're going to be in making the right decisions and having a great customer experience and the growth that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, great. So any anything besides that, uh, do you think like we're going to experience some some biggest change, like big, big changes um, in the next few years in the in the CX world or like uh, do you have like an innovation you want to share that like you're very excited about? It's kind of a difficult question, but <laughs> besides everything we talked about. I get generally excited at the sort of phase of development of the customer engagement technology 
industry, uh, you know, given this forum, I feel like there's been, if you think about the evolution of the space, it's been, okay, we, we need to be able to understand the customer. We need to be able to engage with the customer. Um, and we're at a stage where I think people are starting to say, okay, uh, how can we enable the creation of new experiences, right? Technology integration, platformization of these things. We've had CRMs for years now, um, but actually building out that stack and focusing on that stack um, is, is super exciting to me because then you can get tech enabled experiences and you can start to truly innovate in that space. So I feel like we're about to hit an innovation wave powered a lot by some customer engagement technologies. Um, and that's going to create all kinds of different things, whether it's stimulated by the metaverse or something else. I just think we've been a little hampered on that space and going forwards, we're going to be much more enabled by it. So that gets me excited. Okay. Yeah. I think there will be continue to be a proliferation of technologies to uh, make use of these overall trends and to um, solve various situations and provide additional value. Um, I think that we can take a, a, a page from the marketing uh, history we've seen in marketing operations and marketing technology, a real explosion year by year. It's just mind blowing, really. Uh, people, even in the you know marketing technology uh, world, are uh, baffled every year that it's uh, grown so much. I think we'll be seeing the same thing happening with customer experience technologies, uh, a lot of parallels there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very exciting. Um, great. So, uh, Yang, you 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 mentioned like the uh, uh, the gaming industry, and I I believe that the COVID really impacted uh, this industry. Uh, we've seen like Twitch views just raised and blew up. Uh, we saw a lot of different things happening actually on Twitch, uh, political meetings, uh, concerts. Uh, so a lot of different things happened because. Unfortunately, uh, with 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 the the COVID pandemic, um, so how I would say how did the uh, the the pandemic just change uh, that space exactly? So uh, I mean, I think like a lot of spaces, um, COVID accelerated the current trends. Um, so it, it really um, brought forward some of the meta trends. If you're in the digital space. Um, or you were transforming into a digital space, it really put you on an accelerating path. So in the gaming space, we saw massive growth in all games uh, play as an activity, as a human behavior, um, you know, upwards of 30% brought forwards. Um, but you saw some super interesting, um, what I would call ancillary customer behaviors, which is you started seeing uh, customers using the platform of games to do other things than just play, to socialize, build and develop communities, meet people, get to know people, right? Um, it was fascinating how uh, COVID sort of brought out those capabilities when in the absence of other physical world opportunities, people you know, manage the virtual experience and, and use the virtual experience. And there's a lot of evidence, for example, there was a lot of social good. Uh, from games enabling those kind of connections uh, in a world when they weren't able to do that, COVID world, but they weren't able to do that. I think generally speaking, uh, my feeling, again, not necessarily in game specific, but uh, in COVID is there's a lot of catch up, right? There's a lot of scaling issues that people have had to deal with, a lot of capacity issues. Uh, Amazon certainly uh, talked a lot about um, the impact of the, of the pandemic on their overall business. You just look at Andy Jass's latest CEO email and you can see a bunch of stuff there. Um, uh, but I think most companies now are playing catch up. It's like, okay, well, we really surged to deal with that. Now, how do we backstop it, operate at this scale, uh, continue to support and, and work in that respect? And customer experience is no different and games is no different as well. Um, hugely accelerating now how, you know, having met that customer demand, how do we make sure we sustain it and can support it in a sustainable way going forward? So I think we're in that kind of phase um, of where we are with customer experience around games which is how do we get the systems, you know, generally speaking as well in an Amazon space, Amazon games is, is, you know, we launched our first two big titles uh, in the last six months. They went to become on the, the two of the top 10 most played games uh, on steam. And so, you know, we've gone to a lot of scale very quickly, like a lot of Amazon businesses and a lot of other companies are experiencing those same issues 
Uh, how do you get to scale and then how do you support scale in a sustainable way? Mm -hmm. Okay, Lynn? Yeah, I, um, I know that in the pandemic, technology was uh, much more appreciated than we ever had uh, embraced it because of virtual meetings, telemedicine, uh, e-commerce, uh, virtual delivery, all kinds of things that uh, we relied upon. And it uh, increased the tech savviness of a lot of consumers uh, every age. Uh, people who'd never really been on the computer much or on their cell phones now, um, you know, were forced to because there was no other uh, avenue at that time. Um, so in many ways, uh, it's been really great for technology of all, all sorts. And we need to consider that um, there's much more to the customer experience than just uh, a service uh, engagement, but all of these ways that help people to get things done in their life. Um, so we need to continue that um, that trend of being able to be accessible to um, to, to people in whatever economic uh, circumstance, uh, the different uh, ethnicities and, and and races where there are some some divides, um, and um, also the different generations. Uh, quite interestingly. Um, Generation X that isn't native on uh, technology, but they do use technology uh, for both personal and work uh, purposes. They, they, they're they're an interesting group to uh, to pay attention to because, uh, of course, they're heading into a retirement and uh, have there'll be uh, a lot of a lot of uh, value opportunities for for companies uh, with that group. So I think that um, <clears throat> with the pandemic, we saw that there was an increase of appreciation, but then of course uh, it's a mixed bag uh, going forward as far as uh, people's concerns and what we need to do to shore those up and to fill those uh, divides. And and do, do you think that um, the people, and, and you, you talked about like, you know, our generation X, um, do you think that um, everything is going to go back to where it was or do you think that it's going to stay and just like just go the way it was during the pandemic and no, nothing's going to go back to pre-pandemic uh, phases we're, we're already on a tra trajectory that's been, re been reinforced for two years so um, people will uh, continue to be using tech much more heavily than we did before the pandemic because there are new habits and new expectations that have been set. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Uh, great, so it's gonna be my last question, unfortunately, because time is, uh, is, is running. So um, if you had one uh, advice for, uh, for a company uh, to, uh, to aim at in terms of customer experience in the next few years, what would it be? Go ahead, Ian. <laughs> uh, so I would go back to some of our very first discussion. And I would say you have a choice uh, in your company. If you're a new company or you know, startup, I work a lot with startups as well. Um, uh, if you're a, a new company, uh, you can decide to anchor in the customer now and all of the implications of that. Not silo your organization, make sure your data flows freely. Um, be customer experience centric from the word go uh, because you're going to get there eventually. Uh, and you may choose to take the, well, we need to provide customer support or customer support's too expensive, cut customer support costs, customers start leaving us, or we need to do customer experience management. So you don't, you can avoid going through that journey. Um, if you're an existing custom, uh, company uh, that's in this space, I would say, uh, there, you can defer it as long as you want, but again, you're going to end up having to solve for these problems because there will be companies, upstarts, new companies who will do this better than you. And if they do it better than you, you'll lose. You see that data all over uh, the customer experience management space. If pe companies that manage the customer experience better win. Yeah, 100%. Um, I would recommend that um, if you're in a customer experience technology uh, niche to properly educate people about the scope of what you do 
and um, represent it accordingly because that transparency will be rewarded. Um, there's a lot of misunderstandings among people who are in a, a customer experience job and trying to figure out what to buy and um, having overinflated expectations because they, they're thinking that something is a, a one-stop shop or you know, a be all, be all end all solution uh, because that's the way that it's marketed. And um, I find that it's actually harming our field and customer experience because um, executives of these people that are in a customer experience role get frustrated and they're not seeing the, the results that they had anticipated. And therefore, a lot of times the, the CX team actually gets let go. I know of uh, half a dozen uh, very, lead, very leading edge uh, tech companies in Silicon Valley that have done just that. And uh, if you knew the names, you would you know fall out of your seat that they let their entire CX team go. So that's a responsibility that we have as CX tech providers to proper, properly represent. And for any company, um, regardless of uh, whether you're providing a CX technology or any other type of technology or, or non-tech, um, recognize that as we are using technology more in our work world, in our personal lives, that transparency and, and trust element is going to become, a, become much more of an issue um, because there's so many aspects of expectations that uh, consumers and uh, business customers have. And what, what, we, uh, what we think we're showing may be uh, much more than, well, we may be showing people much more than, than what we think we are in terms of how they're seeing things uh, how they're seeing the real us. So uh, I think there's a, a really important responsibility with technology and also tremendous opportunities. Great. Thank you so much, Lin Yang, uh, for your insight. Uh, thank you again for uh, accepting my uh, invitation. Uh, and so please stay with us for the, for the second part of the uh, presentation today. Thanks, Flo. Looking forward to it. Nice to speak Bye. to you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Uh, great. So we are going to continue with uh, the startup presentation. Uh, and so I'm just going to show you up, uh, the list of people we have today. Uh, so the first person uh, will be uh, Tushar Jain. Uh, he's the founder at uh, N2.ai, uh, and so he's going to uh, present his, uh, his company. N2. Hey, Flo. How are you doing? Yep. I'm go doing good, Flo. How are you doing? How's everything? I'm doing pretty well. I think we, uh, we've talked about this, so, so that's, uh, that's perfect. Sure. So shall we, shall we get started? Yes, you can go. Great. So good morning and good evening, everybody, depending on where in the world uh, you are located. Uh, my name is Tushar. Uh, you can call me TJ. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Enthu.ai. Uh, Enthu is a slang of the English word enthusiasm. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, how to build enthusiasm in your customer facing teams, uh, the real hum humans, you know, by leveraging the power of AI and automation. So, yep, let's get started. Uh, Flo, can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, the next one. Let me start with some background. So as Lynn mentioned, she mentioned a very valid point. We all are customer experience organizations, which means we all talk to our customers day in and day out. And in the process, we generate humongous volume of customer voice data right these this data can be around sales can be around support can be around service and so on and this voice data is rich in customer insights so you can draw trends insights patterns that can improve your offerings and services and you can use it to you know coach your people but unfortunately no data insights get generated from this from this voice data Instead, all this data remains seated on your hard drive simply because it's tough to generate insights. You need a real human listening to this voice data, generating insights and feeding it somewhere so that you know 
some some meaningful uh, insights and trends can be driven out right uh, let's move to the next slide flow so when you are not having a complete visibility into your customer conversations right into the customer data what happens there are four things that happens right the first thing is your visibility you lack visibility into how your humans the real agent sales people are talking to your customers right now as a result when you don't know what's happening in your conversations uh, the coaching these people becomes a challenge because the entire coaching is based on just randomly selected calls as a as a as a fact in the discussion a typical contact center they 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 talk or they listen to only six conversations out of the 1500 odd customer conversations that happen and that's you know less than even 0.1% of the conversation so point here is you already have lower visibility into the conversations into your customer conversations you are not using the cost customer conversations uh, fully to to generate insights as a result your coaching inputs and coaching in pow in outputs they go haywire what it means is your inputs are suboptimal you are not coaching your people right and as a result your performance of the end humans who are interacting with customers it's also suboptimal and the spiral continues because of the fourth point that you see here which is automation and analysis because everything is manual the spiral continues and the entire process is labor intensive and overwhelming you just keep rotating in these four pain points because you can't scale your gen insights generation process right and that's where enthu.ai steps in uh, flow let's move to the next slide that's where enthu.ai kicks in so enthu helps you build rockstar customer facing teams how it gives you 100% visibility into your customer conversations so whatever your agents your sdrs they are talking with the with the end customer enthu captures those conversations monitors them and results in better supervision now when your supervision is better it automatically results in generation of improved you know coaching insights which means you can now coach your agents better and it then impacts on their performance which ultimately results in higher output of those agents the better performance and the spiral then takes the take take goes for a positive spiral loops you know where uh, automation and ai combine help you you know take better decisions across all the three things better monitoring better coaching and better performance management so that's what enthu Uh, does for your contact center organization let's move to the next slide flow so this is simply what enthu.ai does is on the left hand side you have multiple channels of uh, communication with your customers all these channels automatically flow into enthu which can be voice chats vc enthu analyzes those conversations and generate uh, intelligence that is actionable uh it directly impacts the customer experience leading to improved sales or better service deliverability or custom metrics that you have across your customer experience organization let's move forward flow these are some of the metrics that enthu has impacted for for its customers as you would see the 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 core metric is what happens when i monitor 100% of my conversations using ai and automation it impacts both your sales organization as well as service service org organization and results in direct you know driving the uh, driving kpis predictably and consistently next slide flow uh from the technology point of view enthu works silently in the background which means your workflows for agents they don't change they do the work as they have been doing enthu supports three types of integrations the 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 most important integration is the voip platform which means automatically enthu pulls in the conversations from the telephony providers that you use and it then co it can then correlate this data with your crm data with your you know uh, with your with your health desk data and we also support vc tools the ultimate objective is that the data that is fed into the software through multiple channels can be derive can we put ai algorithms on top of it and generate customer insights generate insights that can improve your customer experience next slide please these are some of the use cases that we have solved you'll see on the left hand side a couple of industries that 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 where we are already there this is not a holistic slide but across industries insurance lending contact centers agencies so practically 
uh, industries where there is an interaction with the customer and you have a contact center, whether it's in-house or outsourced, that's immaterial. But if you have a contact center, Enthu can be a good fit for you to help you improve your customer experience. Next slide, please. Yep. So this is, I think, the end of my five minutes and also the end of my presentation. So in the end, I would say a lot is happening within conversations, but are you mining this data to derive business intelligence? That's what Enthu.ai does. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Tushar, for, uh, for presenting your, uh, your solution. Really great. Thank you, Flo. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, great. So we're going to uh, to move to our next presentation, uh, which is going to be uh, Cerebri AI. Um, so we're just going to uh, wait for uh, Ben. Hey, Ben. How you doing? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Perfect. Awesome. Technology great. worked. So awesome. <laughs> the floor is yours, Ben. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Flo, and, and hello, everyone. I would like uh, first thank, I guess, uh, uh, Lian and, and Lean for their insightful comments on, on overall customer experience and, and AI and privacy and all those good things. So uh, I really enjoyed and learned a lot. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm my name is Ben. I'm in Toronto, and I'm CTO, uh, Chief Technology Officer at Astra AI. In Toronto, we always complain about weather, so today is not an exception. It's I guess zero Celsius here, but we are really looking forward to a warm weekend. So anyway, uh, yeah. So thank you. Mm. Yeah, we at Cerebri AI, we, we got a really, I guess, experienced leadership team. Our our CEO, Jean, has established three three startups in the past. Um, he sold his first startup to, to Apple 20 years ago, I believe, uh, which was noted as a as saved Apple um, on, on the news. There are still record up uh, on that if you want to uh, look up. We work with major brands across, across globe. Uh, in auto industry, we work with Mercedes. Ford GM. We also work with uh, Bank of Canada to, to develop a model to predict the GDP of the country, um, which seems to be working really fine and it's in production. Uh, our model uh, has um, has outperformed their, their existing models in, in very, uh, I guess, um, common scenarios. We work in, in financial industry, in financial services on Life Scotia Bank as well, and we work with Oridu and Verizon in telecom. Recently, we worked with Sigma Food in Mexico uh, to predict customer churn. So, so our goal uh, and our vision mission is to provide answers and actions for the toughest journeys. Go to the next slide, please. Yep. So we believe in journeys. Uh, we believe in, uh, in, digi in digital data and journeys. Uh, we started with, with customer journeys uh, a couple of years ago, but soon enough we realized journeys can apply to, to other things as well, like travelers, employees, all those. And we are, we are pretty much all on, uh, on journeys, I guess, on a day-to-day -day basis. And our goal is to provide answers as a service. We are not a tools uh, um, company. We provide answers. Uh, we, we get data. We run end-to-end -end data pre-processing and uh, we make model ready data points and we run AI model to provide answers. Well, we answer tough questions by, by basically eliminating the, the common barriers that you see in the market. One of the, one of the barriers is that uh, you talk to different groups and teams, they always, there's always a complaint about like, we don't have enough data. And, and I don't think that's gonna go um, away anytime soon because the data is evolving. So at any given point, you look at it and say, oh, no, my data is not perfect. But there's still a lot that can be extracted from that data to provide answers. And that's what we do. Yep. Like I said, we believe on journeys. So we are all on journeys. Um, next slide. Some days as a customer, some days as an employee, and some day as a traveler or just enjoying life. So the way that uh, the way that we we process the first step is uh, for us is we are focusing on customers. Um, 
here today, um, the first step is to define the, the questions. The questions we, we usually answer is that who, when, what, and where. Like I said, we worked uh, in, in telecom. We built uh, several models to, to predict churn, dormancy, engagement, uh, selling, upselling, cross-selling, B2C, B2B. Um, and then at Oridu, we, we, we processed about 10 billion events to predict the, the churn of the, of the current customers. And then we, and, and we, and our models are basically outperformed these existing models by about 5x uh, lift. In auto, it's a little bit different. Um, uh, you still have those, I guess, who, when, what, where, but there is a financial component as well. At least in North America, uh, when you want to get a new car, you need to get a loan. And when you get a loan, the, uh, the, the company or the credit company, they would like to make sure that they minimize their risk and, and also maximize the customers they get. So there's a component of the, of the financial um, risk management that we embedded into our models to, to make sure that as we predict uh, what, uh, who's going to buy, when it's going to buy, and what they're going to buy, uh, it's also important to make sure that the risk uh, for, the, for the companies or the creditors are going to be minimized as well. In the financial services, uh, as I talked, like we worked with uh, Sun Life and, and, and Scotia Banking in Canada, uh, we developed models for their high net worth customers on what's the next loan or what would be the, um, a good product to offer them, um, again, answering the four main uh, questions. The second step is that like now we know the questions that we are answering or we are expert in answering those questions. So the next step is to talk about the data, what data we use. We use transactions, marketing, service, demographic, call center, telemetry, internet, and, and pretty much anything, any data that we can get access to. We are not a data company, so our role is not to acquire data, but any data that's available, we, uh, we use it. Uh, when it comes to marketing, what we found really interesting is that, or what helped our models is the offer that um, our, our customers made to their clients and, and, and their reaction from, uh, from clients. That helped our reinforcement model, reinforcement learning models and, and deep QN models to, to learn effectively and, and provide marketing offers in a more efficient way. When it comes to call center, probably you guys, uh, we all have, I guess, one or two experiences that we were suffering with the service or product. So we called call center and, and rather than getting that product resolved or that issue resolved, the next day we get another offer for a new product. And so like, please, I have an issue with the current one. So why are you uh, sending me a new offer uh, for a new product? And that happened to me here a lot with the telecom company that I'm working with. Now, when I call, say, okay, well, here's the internet issue. And the day after I receive a new offer for, I don't know, HBO Max or, or Netflix and all those things, oh, come on, like, I'm not going to do that. I have an issue. So it's, it's really important. Uh, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that it's really important to understand the customer journey uh, rather than focusing on specific products because for a product, I could be a right customer, but I'm struggling with other things. So before solving them, uh, I cannot really go ahead and offer Offer, offer a new product. So that's the reason we found um, call center data being super helpful for us in developing those models. Can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, and the third step is to basically data engineering and, and pre-processing the data. Our, our engineering platform is based on Apache Pulsar. Uh, we, we invested about $20 million in the last few years to build this, to build this platform. So we are capable of ingesting and, and processing real-time data. We can do batch do, but we are prepared to do the, to do the real-time. We get, we get uh, data from all different sources and we can combine them to provide model ready data. When the data is ready, running the model on that, it's like a no brainer as we all know, and, and we can get to the answers and action. This is, this is kind of like aligns with the overall data centric approach that you guys um, may have seen uh, picking up in, in the market for AI, uh, kind of like moving from the hype of the AI models, deep learning, because the models are great. The data is kind of like, I mean, a little bit problematic. So we are trying to solve that, uh, solve that gap. Uh, ben, sorry to interrupt. Uh, just, we, uh, we passed the five minutes, just, just, uh, asking you to, uh, to get close to sure. the end. Yeah. Sure. No, sure. Sorry sure. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Let's then. Yep. Yeah, let's pass this one. 
Yeah, let's go to slide 17 maybe, and then I'll wrap up in less than 30 seconds, I promise. Yeah, this one, thank you. So uh, yeah, we, we we were really active in um, in submitting patents. Uh, we have 26 patents filed and nine granted. Two of them were granted, I guess, and filed like I mean, in the last two weeks, which we are uh, super excited on. So, so to, to wrap up, uh, we provide answers as a service. We have done predictions. We have done actions. We are actively looking for a client that we can do adjudication layer. Um, imagine that you have several actions to take as a, as, a, as a company with your client, but which action you're gonna take to maximize customer experience or to enhance customer experience and also maybe satisfy a couple of KPIs or business, business goals that you have. And those business goals change quarter by quarter. So having the adjudication layer in a customer experience platform is gonna be uh, super, 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 I guess, uh, critical. So thank you so much. Sorry, I'm over time. But it's great to be <laughs> no, no problem. No problem, Ben. Thank you so much. Sorry for that. Yeah. We have to, uh, you know, stay on no, schedule for other, yeah. other presenters. Thank All you good. so much, Ben. Uh, no and uh, have a great day. Uh, great. So we're going to uh, continue uh, with uh, Gearbrand. So I'm going to uh, share the presentation. Uh, and so Mark Westlake uh, will be presenting. He's the founder and CEO uh, at uh, Gearbrain. We're just gonna wait for him. Hello, Mark. I think your uh, your mic. How about now? Good. <laughs> Perfect, Mark. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Uh, we're going to kind of take a different little tack here in terms of the customer experience that we're solving for. Uh, some of you people, if you've ever experienced trying to buy products through, you know, knowing a product, what you, you know, knowing what you want to buy, and using various ways to buy this product. Think about smart devices and all these connected devices. And if you go to the next slide, uh, there's a big, big challenge right now. There's a, this lack of interoperability between all these smart devices. And, you know, I was listening before to Ian from Amazon, you know, talking about costly returns. A lot of these devices have been returned because there's so much confusion and frustration out there because they all work on different wireless protocols. And after years of working for and building some successful digital tech businesses, uh, you know, I saw this problem coming and nobody was focused on it. So, you know, I wanted to, you know, my sister-in-law, you know, she bought a, uh, they gave her a smartwatch, but it wouldn't work with her phone because, it worked on different operating system. You know, they their phone was old, and these new new devices work on real, the most recent OS. So it was very frustrating. So we came out with it, you know, and started to dig into this. And besides the lack of interoperability, imagine if you know what you're looking for. If you go to the next slide, you'll find that it's very very hard to find. You know these products, or if you've used Google or Bing any search engines, it's very difficult to find product information. Yes, you can you know, search for secure camera, 100 degree field of view and spend time and days reading rev uh, uh, reviews or watching videos. And it's very, you know, it, it's a pain in the butt. And then I also found, if you go to the next slide, that, you know, it's not easy to buy these things, right? You know, uh, there's a lack of interoperability, but not all, uh, but there's a lack of filtering. You know, people don't go deep. No one gives you a holistic view. What's interesting is Amazon doesn't sell Google products. Google doesn't sell Amazon products. Walmart doesn't sell Amazon products. And then everybody else sells probably a combination, but they don't give you a holistic view. All right. And it's very, very time consuming. And it's no wonder a lot of the, the band, the credit card ban or the card abandonment rate is so high. There's got to be a better way for someone who knows what they're looking for, right? Can go on and imagine if they could research discover, buy, and then even go a step further and learn how to connect and optimize these devices in one place. Wouldn't that be great? Well, we go to, that's the next slide. That's what we do. That's what Gearbrain does. We have, it's now, I can update this slide. It's now a patented 
compatibility find engine. So you're like, what is a compatibility find engine? It's criteria based searching. You plug in the information you're looking for. I'm looking for a security camera, 100 degree field of view, and you'll see all the products that meet that criteria. All right. If and and then if you wanted the compatibility piece is the unique experience that we've added, which now allows you to say, okay, I, yeah, I'm looking for a security camera, 100 degree field of view. But I want it to work through my Google Assistant smart display. So you tell us the smart display you have, and we'll show you all the products that are compatible. And now what you could do is you can go even a step further is now you could you get a consideration set. You could learn on how to buy. You could ask questions. You could actually store that product information for future use, whether you want to look for, you know, troubleshooting ideas, or you're looking for a link to customer service or what have you. So this platform does a lot and, and nobody else is doing it. And it solves that big pain point of the lack of inter interoperability and just simplify smart devices, which is the key to get the users to buy the right products, you know, so they're not bringing it back to the retailer. It's also this platform is being used. We're licensing the platform. We have a white label solution. We white label it where people can use this to enhance their customer service experience, right? Because it has all the information. So if you're an ISP and you're selling smart devices that you don't manufacture, you're going to get a call from your subscriber saying, why, am I, why is my smart lock not working? Wouldn't it be great to be able to give them an automated solution that says, okay, here, oh, you're having a problem? Here's everything you need to know about that product. And if you need to, here's the phone number to call to or email uh, to get the answers you're looking for. So that's what GearBrain, that's, and this is a global problem. So we're focused on the U.S., but it is a global platform, and you can come in and learn about these devices and just make it easier for you. And that's what GearBrain, that's the customer experience that we're trying to enhance. And we're going to be layer on an AI uh, to, to make it easier for people to, to see or, or to use their smart speakers to actually get answers to questions based on the data that we have. We have over 4,300 products growing uh, and we have you know the ability to search across 300 different attributes. And we're going to improve the UI because we're going to have to teach people how to use this platform, too. And that's a thing that uh, we're really ex uh, excited about. But it does make people's lives easier. And it focuses on the big problem of solving that lack of interoperability and making it easier for people to research, discover, buy, and learn how to connect and optimize smart devices. And soon it will be outside of smart devices into other categories like automotive and, and digital health and supply chain management. That's it. Simple, quick, get us back on track. How's that? <laughs> that was perfect. Great presentation and Thank great you. solution. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. Great. Um, all right. So we're going to move on uh, with uh, Jeffrey. Uh, he's going to present Leaf Forward. Um, and I'm going to uh, share the presentation. Um, I don't have the presentation for uh, Lyft Tour. So, Jeffrey, if you can uh, join us, uh, you can uh, definitely um, share your screen. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi. Can you uh, hold on a second? Sorry for. Yeah, no problem. Let me. Um, I don't see the. Um... Let me so just there, there's a share button uh, at the, right. the bottom of your screen. And at the top, it says share screen. Got it. Give me one second. Mm -hmm. And let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, uh, for now, not yet. Not yet. No, no, yeah, it's not, it's not working yet. Sorry, let me go back here. Oh, I got it. Okay, it should be. Mm -hmm. Yep. It should uh, be. No. It's coming. Yes, we can see. Perfect. The floor is yours. Okay, great. Uh, Jeffrey Rogers, CEO of. Lift Forward, we work um, in the uh, subscription field. So 
everyone knows what a subscription is uh, by now, but what we specialize is where there is a device involved and it needs to be bundled with services and other software. So we, in a, in a sentence, we turn products into services and we focus on the customer engagement. Um, the easiest thing, given the time that we have, um, I will just share with you a case study and you can better understand what we do. So one of our clients is Xbox. We run a program called Xbox All Access. And this is a program where for a monthly price, you get the device, uh, all the games, um, and also a uh, warranty wrapped in for 24 months. Uh, this program is offered in uh, 15 different countries, and because it's a subscription where you just pay a, a monthly fee, there's financing involved. Uh, and Xbox does not go directly, they go to retailers. So that's where we come in. We provide the software subscription platform in which all the stakeholders integrate into. So from, um, and what you're looking at is how it runs in the US. So in the US, integrated into our platform for this program is Xbox. Uh, we have to the left, uh, Citizens is the bank that finances it. Uh, in the middle of the retailers it goes through, and then the right are third parties that add some kind of value add service to the subscription. Um, we are uh, omni-channel, and so we really focus on the customer journey. So we're at the point of sale online and also in call centers where this is, this is offered. So uh, the moment the customer gets sold on the subscription, we take that data and pass it to the relevant parties. Uh, the first party will go to the financial institution to decide whether or not this uh, applicant becomes a customer. Once uh, we get a yes, the customer signs on our technology. We then send notification to uh, all the relevant parties to deliver the services. If it's in store, then um, say it's Best Buy. Best Buy will, will get notification to release the equipment. Or if it's online, it will be shipped. And then we manage the whole process, say it's 24 months during that term. So the customer can have a place to log on to manage a subscription if they need anything to get help, they can get it from our software. And then the most important thing and reason why companies do subscriptions is for lifetime value of the customer. So the big part of this is the upgrade. So at the end, we managed a process to get the old device back, ship you the new device and keep that subscription going. So that increases the lifetime value of the customer. Lynn talked about this. The last thing you wanna do is lose a customer. And so we focus on making sure you keep that customer for, for many more years than, than uh, a simple purchase. And with that, I will um, turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Jeffrey. Uh, great presentation. Thanks so much for joining today. Sure. Great. Uh, moving on with uh, Richard from uh, OCX, uh, sorry. Yeah, OCX Cognition. Uh, so I'm going to share the presentation uh, and Richard is going to uh, join in a second. So um, Richard Owen is the uh, founder uh, at uh, OCX Cognition. Uh, so he's up, a few buttons to click, I guess. Uh, he's going to be with us in a second. Hello, Richard. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for joining today. Oh, of course. Thank you. Well, uh, it's been a very interesting uh, meeting, lots of great presentations. Let me let me dive in and get right to the point. Um, so we are focused, I think, a little bit differently than perhaps some of the other presentations on the challenge faced by large, complex business to business companies that are dealing with managing significant portfolios of customers with lots of different contract durations, lots of different uh, values and growth potential for those customers. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, the challenge from a CX perspective that all of these leaders face in these businesses, they want to get the best possible insight into the health of their customers, which accounts for at risk, why they are, what their teams need to do, and how the experience they're delivering is impacting those customers or where they want to make changes to it. 
And so our platform predicts and re-predicts continuously the Net Promoter Score and a whole suite of operational performance measures for every customer based on the interactions from operational data in the business. And that gives us a sort of KPI formula for operational success. Do these uh, handful of operational executions correctly and you'll highly likely create promoters out of your customer base and you'll increase the likelihood of, of retention amongst those accounts. Next slide, please. So this industry already exists in many ways. Uh, depending on your estimate, I saw some data earlier on, my number's even bigger, so to make of it what you will. Enterprises are spending billions of dollars on survey technology in an attempt to measure customer experience. My last company, Satmetrics, co-created the Net Promoter Score methodology some 16 or 17 years ago. And we implemented over a thousand enterprise scale CX analytics initiatives based on that methodology, all basically doing surveys. Well, the challenge is survey data is not very good. In a classic B2B environment, you may get a response from a customer once or twice a year, maybe 10, 15% of your customers respond. It's not even clear the right people are responding. So the data level you have is extremely poor. And yet it was a business that has thrived because the value of getting some sort of insight into customer attitudes was so high. Uh, however, technology changes have made it possible to come up with a far, far superior data set uh, by instead of just literally measuring through surveys, uh, using surveys to teach machines to predict the behavior of customers based on their actual experiences and create not just a data set that covers every customer, not just those who respond to surveys, but a data set that continuously adjusts as customers experience the business. So if a major account experienced something negative yesterday, the algorithms will re-predict the likelihood that they are a promoter, the likelihood that they would renew a contract instantaneously and give sales teams and portfolio managers a really um, data-orientated view of their performance. Next slide, please. Now, I'm not going to get into a whole bunch of exciting uh, technology conversations. Sufficient to say that, as you might imagine, we look at all of the data across the entirety of the journey, which is held in multiple systems of engagement that exist within companies, ranging from CRM systems to support systems, onboarding systems, depends on the industry. Uh, in reality, most large companies have challenges orchestrating all this data. So we have to build solutions that deal with uh, data that's messy, that's not always accessible, uh, the realities of data engineering, which can be a challenge. So our algorithms and our approach is very robust in the face of very complex multiple systems with limited aspects. Otherwise, it wouldn't work in the real world. However, once we have this data organized across the journey, the predictive algorithms process it and come up with highly accurate predictions of customer behavior. What we're essentially saying is that based on what a customer has experienced in your operation, we assign a probability to the likelihood they are a promoter or a detractor, and we attribute that reason to the operations that created it. So maybe they're a detractor because of a poor sequence of uh, service experiences, or maybe it was a result of poor onboarding or poor use of product. All of those operational factors provide attribution. And at the end of the day, all this goes into an assisted machine learning engine, which generates the data continuously. And as you can imagine, then gets distributed to the teams that use this to inform their opinions on what to do with their customers. Next slide. So uh, just a touch on our business, as you can imagine, this is targeting large, complex B2B enterprises. So our typical customer is well in excess of $1 billion in revenue. To give an example, um, that perhaps calibrates this a little bit, Experian, one of the world's largest data and credit service companies, is one of our earliest customers on this, on this platform. So our customers are typically dealing with multiple segments of customers, multiple product lines, multiple geographies. In other words, a very complex data environment, lots of moving parts and thousands of employees who are engaging the customer across multiple touch points. So everything we do is geared up to solve that problem of complexity and scale. 
We launched our first fully live SaaS product last July and started working with six enormous enterprises. At this point, we've had 100% success in deployments. And what I define success as is that we have highly accurate and verifiable predictions of the behavior of those customers. And so as our business grows, we are building more analytics technology that will enable companies to learn more from that data set that's now being created. Uh, and so that remains our focus is serving uh, those large complex business to business customers. So to summarize, in some ways we represent the next stage in evolution from survey based technology as a way to think about measuring customer attitudes to predictive analytics as a way to build a much more comprehensive and real time set of how customers do behave and will behave based on the experiences that they're having and provide that data to teams that have to deal with the customer to give them a comprehensive and singular view of the performance in their business. I appreciate the invitation to be here. Thank you all very much. I hope you uh, found it interesting. Yes, very interesting. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, great. Uh, so let's move to our uh, last presentation uh, with Justin. Uh, so Justin Clegg is the uh, founder and CEO at Allset. Uh, so he's going to share his screen directly. Hi everyone, my name is Justin. It's great to be here and uh, good to see everybody. Great, thank you so much Justin for being here. Shout out to uh, all of those who have stayed with us so far. <laughs> And hello from our uh, HQ offices uh, here in Utah. Um, our claim to fame in Utah is we're actually the uh, home of the second largest SaaS acquisition in customer experience, uh, which was Qualtrics, uh, which was recently acquired by SAP for uh, a cool $8 billion. So it's nice to be here um, and excited to share more about what we're building at Allset. I'll go ahead and share my screen now. And it looks like I'm going to need to uh, authorize the browser. Uh, so <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm sharing. Uh, so, yes. No worries. Go ahead. Let's see. It's a few clicks. Sometimes you have to refresh your browser. No worries. All right, we're just going to wait, sorry for that. Um, it's, it's not gonna be long. <laughs> All right, everyone, we're back. And, uh, no guarantee of uh, screen sharing capability here. So let's uh, give this another try. Yes, definitely. Um, as an alternative, uh, do you have an ability to share your screen? And I can just go ahead and share our presentation live with you here. Is there a chat capability? Um, I'm not sure I can do that now, unfortunately. I'm not at the control. I'm not at the control of the Livestone platform right now, unfortunately. No. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's let's improvise. Uh, I, I think uh, we're certainly uh, capable of, of talking about what we're building without uh, slides. So um, we'll just dive in. So uh, at the, the core of what we're building is a conversational texting platform uh, that's built for home services. So we define home service businesses. Uh, as SMBs or local businesses that specialize in things like contract or trades work, uh, 
window washers, residential cleaners, carpet cleaning, painters, uh, plumbing, HVAC, uh, to name a few. So home service businesses uh, are a massive market uh, in North America. We have 5 million businesses uh, in North America and uh, all of them need the tools to be able to run and grow their business and provide uh, more frictionless experiences. So our uh, market size today is an $800 billion market. It's growing to 1 trillion here in the next two to three years. We're positioned to be one of Utah's fastest growing companies, scaling our company from zero to 200K plus ARR um, in just the last few months. Uh, so to kind of explain uh, as far as what we do, uh, we are automated personalized messaging at scale. So we're helping home service businesses deliver SMS-based frictionless experiences via text-to-pay, automated tipping, reviews, and referrals to help these businesses uh, provide uh, easier communications, frictionless payments, uh, and uh, better customer engagement. At the end of the day, uh, we leverage our customers' CRM data to be able to know when to send an automated communication to a business's customer. So for example, if your home is recently cleaned, a cleaning business that's running on all set will send you a text that will say, thank you for letting us serve you today. Would you like to leave a tip? The average American today is leaving a $35 tip on all set. And we generated nearly $200,000 in tips, 100%, which we've sent back to these businesses to help combat labor shortage, hiring, and retention. So all set is as simple as connecting to your CRM, whether that's Jobber, House Call Pro, ZenMade, or any other scheduling system, completing appointments, and all set takes care of the rest in terms of engaging customers and customer communication. We run a subscription SaaS model, and we charge 199 bucks per month we also are taking a 1% margin on all payments process through our platform. So a $300 cleaning appointment in your home, all set is capturing about $3 per appointment, which allows us to get to about a $7,000 annual customer value uh, per merchant. And we're seeing a lot of exciting revenue come in. If you'd like to learn more uh, or see our presentation, which uh, we'd love to share, when we have screen sharing capabilities, um, you can email me at justin at allsethq.com. We're finalizing one of our rounds uh, for fundraising. And if you'd like to participate, uh, we're happy to have those conversations. Uh, it's an honor to be here. We're grateful to see the connection between uh, French and American communities. And hopefully uh, I was able to articulate briefly in under five minutes uh, what we're building and how we're solving for customer experience using conversational commerce AI and conversational texting. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a great presentation, even with uh, with a presentation. Uh, so we'll we'll make sure to uh, to include the uh, your presentation in the replay, though. Uh, so no no worries. Thanks so much, uh, Justin, uh, and uh, and thank you uh, to all the presenters. I uh, I hope to uh, to see you soon. Uh, so before uh, we end this uh, this uh, this presentation, I just wanted to uh, to show you the uh, the agenda for our uh, next event uh, that will take place in San Francisco um, on July seventh around the energy transition. Uh, so we're going to have uh, great people. So if you are able to attend, uh, it will be a pleasure to uh, to welcome you as well. Um, so thank you again and. Uh, if, uh, if uh, you have any questions for me, you can reach out to me uh, either on LinkedIn or via email. And uh, I will see you next time. Bye-bye.